Hi everyone, I'm Linwood Pendleton and I'm the Executive Director of the Ocean Knowledge Action Network. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share this recorded presentation with you about how co-design of science can address issues of climate change and talk to you particularly about how the Ocean Knowledge Action Network is helping to catalyze this co-design and share knowledge across countries so we can tackle climate change together. I hope you enjoy this recorded presentation and I look forward to talking to you later in our question and answer period. Thanks so much. Climate change is, of course, changing everything we know about the planet, but it's especially affecting the ocean. This image here shows the monthly average sea surface temperature for May 2015. Between 2013 and 2016, a large mass of unusually warm ocean water, nicknamed the blob, dominated the North Pacific indicated here by red, pink, and yellow colors, signifying temperatures as much as three degrees Celsius higher than average. These data are from the NASA Multiscale Ultra High Resolution Sea Surface Temperature um, Analysis product, and they're reflective of the kinds of trends that we've been seeing in ocean heat waves that are caused by climate change. We're seeing more heat waves and more intense heat waves and these heat waves are really driving a major change in our ocean ecosystem. Ocean heat waves can kill organisms and can lead to the widespread death or wholesale shifts of ecosystems. From a human perspective, this can mean a loss of food when fisheries are affected and a loss of culturally important species. These heat waves are one of the major issues that climate change poses to human well-being. A warming ocean also fuels more intense storms. A warmer ocean results in sea level rise and coastal flooding, and combined storms, higher high tides, and coastal flooding can cause life, loss of life, property, and ecosystem damage. Of course, a warming ocean also leads to coral reef bleaching. As many as a billion people depend on coral reefs for their shoreline protection, for food, and for their livelihoods from tourism. Coral reefs are home to 25% of all marine species, all of which are threatened by a warmer ocean. As the ocean has gotten warmer and hotter, especially during summertime months, what we have seen is an increase in the frequency of coral bleaching. When this coral bleaching lasts for a long time, it can lead to the death of coral reefs and the loss of all of those services and species that we've grown to depend upon. Of course, a warmer ocean can also lead to more algal blooms, and many of these algal blooms are toxic. Toxic algal blooms kill wildlife, they make seafood unsafe to eat, and can cause direct harm to humans. And of course, I think you all know, and this is what you'll be talking about during much of the conference, is that climate change has direct impacts on the food chain. Temperature data and models are used to identify vulnerable fisheries, help us adjust quotas, and implement new rules for fishing. And this is important because what we're seeing with climate change is that the production of many types of fish is significantly lower in places where we're used to catching those fish. But probably more importantly, the distribution of fish is changing rather dramatically because of changing sea temperature. This is changing where fish um, are, are born, where they grow up, and, and where we catch them. And if we don't know where the fish are, we can't manage them well, and we can't depend on them for the important food that they provide. Of course, science has a big role to play in how we adapt to and deal with these challenges caused by climate change. But it's important that the science we have is up to the task. In the past, we used to talk about science to policy. That is, how do we get science into the hands of policymakers, people who need the science, so they can do a better job of managing the ocean and managing really the people who depend on the ocean. 
But what we found is that in many cases, the science just isn't the science that's needed to make these decisions. It isn't the science that we need to plan. So I think what we're seeing now is that this science to policy way of working is dead. Instead, what we see is people now focusing more on mission-oriented science, the co-design, the co-production, and the co-delivery of science with stakeholders, the co-creation of knowledge, and this is sometimes called open science. And the idea is to work with decision makers, to work with stakeholders from the very beginning so that we understand the decisions that are being made, whether it's where you're going to get your meal this evening or where you're going to put aquaculture or wind farms, so that we make sure that when we do science, we're answering the questions that decision makers need to know the answers to in order to do this planning. And that includes how we collect data about the ocean, ocean observations. Are they at the right frequency? Are they at the right scale? Are we measuring the right things? To do this kind of mission-oriented science, what we need is to first ask what and then ask who. When we ask what, we ask what decisions are being affected by climate change? What decisions can be taken to do something about climate change and its impacts on the ocean and people? What plans, what development scenarios could be affected by climate change? And then what information do planners need? We can also ask what models or predictions can help planners and decision makers do a better job of predicting the future and understanding the consequences of the actions that we'll take. What scientific understanding needs to be improved if we're going to understand what the impacts are of doing policy A versus policy B? That often requires that we test hypotheses that haven't been tested before, or we collect information and test these hypotheses in places where they haven't been collected before. We also need to ask what is needed so that when we collect this data and when we do this science, people trust it and are willing to make decisions based on this science. And then finally, what solutions and what science may already exist that will help us know what the ocean is going to do and what new science and new solutions um, need to be conducted in order to address the unknowns of climate change. Now this is the what, but if we're going to co-design science, that means we have to do it with people. And so we have to ask who, who are the people that need this information? Who is dealing with the problems that climate change is causing? Who has the power to make decisions? Is it the mother of a household who's deciding what food to buy? Is it the mayor who is going to decide um, how his coastline is protected? Is it the president of the country who has to look out and say, what are we going to do as a country to deal with climate change? And she may need to understand who and what science will need to be conducted over the next decade so that she and her cabinet are prepared to make these decisions. And of course, who has the resources to do something about this problem? We also need to know who are the researchers that we need to bring together to try to address these scientific questions. And who, often social scientists, really understands what's required to build trust in data and trust in science. And then who can really understand what the social, political, and economic dimensions are to know whether the data and science will be useful or when and how they can be used. And then who are the innovators in society that we can bring to the table to help create new ways of doing science? And finally, who are the people that can bring us all together around the table 
so that we do this in a way that's constructive, productive, and effective. This is the whole point of co-design. It's connecting end users and connecting scientists. But more than that, as I mentioned, it's bringing facilitators together with these end users and the scientists. Funders, whether it's the government or philanthropy or private business and investors. And then finally, this is M&E, this monitoring and evaluation has to be an important part of the way we do co-design of science. We need to know that we're doing a better job of making science that's actionable. If we're just involving stakeholders, that's not enough. We want to make sure that involving stakeholders and involving facilitators and involving scientists of all disciplines really leads to better and more actionable science. When we do that, when we bring all of these people together, that really is the code design of science. And it leads to solutions, we hope, but it also leads to knowledge about how we did this because there are a lot of people who have not yet participated in the code design of science. And so we want to work, we being the Ocean Knowledge Action Network, want to work with scientists and facilitators and end users and funders to co-design science to achieve solutions, but also to take the knowledge that we've gained by doing this and share it with others. Now to do this co-design of science, it often means that we have to sit down and begin to map out the opportunities for go design. You don't just get scientists and stakeholders and put them in a room and say, go at it and design science together. What you have to do is first, you have to really start to understand what are all the challenges that we face that require new science, new data, and new technology. And of course, for us, that's looking at the new science um, that's needed to, to address ocean challenges. And then, as I mentioned, who are the stakeholders that are associated with these challenges that are either affected by these challenges or can take action against these challenges? What are the decisions that they need to make? And what are the solutions that we might apply? We have to look at the ability to do the science at local and regional levels and recognize that we may need science from outside our local or regional areas. We also want to look at funding opportunities to see who's willing to fund this kind of science and opportunities that exist to connect with scientists from around the world so we can bring the very best science to bear on these problems. And one opportunity to do that is through the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. What are the opportunities to use these large programs that have been proposed for the decade to answer local and regional problems. And once we've done all of this mapping, we can start to see where we have opportunities to bring people together so we can co-design proposals for science and then get these proposals funded so we can begin to conduct this science. And as we do this, as we do this co-design of science around Taiwan, for instance, but in Taiwan and in Indonesia and in the Seychelles and in Brazil, what we want to do is be able to share the knowledge that we're gaining so that people don't make mistakes and so they can benefit from each other and the learning that we have. As we do this, we build first a community of practice, but really what we're doing is building a network of networks. These communities of practice, they grow and they grow and it becomes increasingly difficult, but even more important to share knowledge across these communities and these networks. And that really is the job of the Ocean Knowledge Action Network. Because ultimately, the people inside these communities, inside these networks, are the ones that we need to connect. And the way we're doing that at the Ocean Knowledge Action Network is by creating a hybrid human and digital network of networks. On the human side, we're working with our on-the-ground collaborators like the Future Earth, um, Taipei, and Academica Seneca, but also Nelson Mandela University in South Africa with the Brazil Future Oceans Panel at the University of Sao Paulo, the Federal University of Sao Paulo. We're working with the University of Ghana and Monterey Bay Aquarium 
and the Virtual Ocean Decade in the Campus Mondial de la Mer in France as our on-the-ground collaborators, people who really need science and who use science to inform the public and to inform decisions. We call these our human hubs. And the Ocean Knowledge Action Network is trying to link these human hubs with international activities, especially programs of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science. So we are working in our first year here with two um, science and action programs from the UN Ocean Decade. One is the Glo Global Ecosystem of Ocean Solutions, and we are working as an Ocean Knowledge Action Network specifically with their Blue Foods program in their Coastal Adaptation program. And we're also working with Marine Life 2030, which is a program focused on marine biodiversity and the effects of climate change on marine biodiversity. The Ocean Knowledge Action Network is also working with three UN Ocean Decade networking programs. One is SmartNet, which is part of the ICES Pisces um, set of networks. It's largely focused on uh, fish, but not exclusively in fishery science. We're working with the Early Career Ocean Professionals Network, and we're working with the Empowering Women in the Decade Network. So we're, we're building this vertical network that combines our hubs with these international initiatives, and then making sure we connect them with scientists around the world by working through our sister um, science networks that are all part of Future Earth, including the Earth Systems Governance Oceans Task Force, um, MBER, SOLAS, Future Earth Coasts, the World Climate Research Program, the International Science Council's Science Committee on Ocean Research, known as SCORE, and the Ocean Climate Platform. Now, you can see we're already starting to talk about a lot of networks here and a lot of countries. So the digital part of what we're doing is work that we're co-designing with a not-for-profit company from Denmark called Actor Global. Now, Actor Global is designed to help create digital networks of networks to foster cross-collaboration of people who may be in one or more networks, or maybe within one network, but would benefit from connecting, say, to a working group in another network. The Actor platform helps these um, networks share activities with each other, and it really helps them to build a global ecosystem where will help us, the Ocean Knowledge Action Network, build a global ecosystem of people, not just networks. So our goal uh, is to now work with Future Earth and Future Earth Taipei specifically to try to connect the work that you're doing particularly the co-design of ocean science with the work that's happening in the rest of the world that involves the co-design of science. So the rest of the world can benefit from the knowledge that you're generating, not just about the ocean, but about how to work with stakeholders. And so that Taipei can benefit from the work that's happening in the rest of the world in the same way. And that really is the goal. So I'm very excited to be able to speak to you today to get this kicked off. I look forward to visiting Taipei as soon as possible so I can begin to work with my colleagues there at Future Earth and begin to build this Ocean Knowledge Action Network together with all of you in Taipei. Thank you very much for your time and attention and I look forward to answering your questions.